invited to TED, I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about, but not quite how I was going to keep it all from fleeing for the exit. My talk is not an easy one to listen to, but I do believe it is an important one. It is important because it impacts us all, directly and often indirectly. It leaves no country or community untouched, irrespective of socioeconomic standing, race, religion, or other. I'm here today to talk to you about child sexual abuse. I spent over a decade exploring the world of child sexual abuse with my camera and a sound recorder. I focused on South Africa to show how a people, a country, a people, the police and the judiciary dealt with this issue. So today I'd like to share some stories from this project, stories which I believe will leave you with a deeper sense of understanding and compassion for those who've endured such child sexual abuse, and in the hope that hearing these stories will give others the courage to speak out about their own, and thus put them on the road to healing. Because in the words of the great Maya Angelou, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'd like to start by taking you all on a visual journey. This is the teddy bear clinic for abused children in Johannesburg. This young girl is trying to escape from the room where she is to undergo a forensic gynecological examination. These are the underwear of a three-year-old victim of rape. These have been kept by the police for forensic evidence. The mother of another young victim, whose underwear were also taken for evidence, kept returning to the police station to ask when she could have them back. And it was only after a few visits that she explained that her daughter only owned a couple of under pairs of underwear, and that by taking one away, she didn't have enough. After that, the Police Child Protection Unit in Johannesburg began including a pair of underwear in each of the kits that they gave to these children. This is Angie. She was 12 years old and the survivor of a rape. Her mother was murdered trying to protect her from it. This is Nonsa, not yet three years old, and six months earlier, she was grabbed from outside her home and brutally sodomized. She was found later that day bleeding profusely and spent two months in hospital and endured several life-saving surgeries. The surgeon in charge said that it was very likely that Nomsa would be incontinent for the rest of her life, meaning that she would be wearing nappies, diapers for the rest of her life. This is the scar on Nomsa's abdomen, the result of all the surgeries she endured. Every morning when Nomsa wakes up and looks at herself in the mirror, this scar will be a cruel reminder of her horrific rape. There will be no way to forget it. While I worked with the police, I documented the search for Sheldin and Camogelo, both seven years old when they went missing. During the one month search for little Camogelo, Inspector Stropi Krobela would stop by the home of Anna, her aunt and adoptive mother, every single day to give her an update. Seven year old Camogelo was last seen walking hand in hand with an unknown man. She was never found again. The body of seven year old Sheldine was discovered two weeks after her disappearance. The perpetrator, a 24-year-old man known to Sheldine, had taken her for a walk, and when he tried to touch her inappropriately, she kicked him, so he strangled her and sexually assaulted her body.
So here are some facts about child sexual abuse. According to a 2014 report by UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, they estimated at least 120 million girls under the age of 20, that is to say one in 10 girls had experienced some form of sexual violence. But that is what we know of. There are millions more, mil including millions of boys who have never told anybody about their abuse. It's a global issue. So I'd like to tell you about Dylan. I met Dylan when he was 39 years old. At the age of eight, he was sexually abused for two years by his scout master and catechism teacher who also took photos of his abuse of Dylan. By the age of 13, Dylan was trading sex for money with the attitude that whoever wanted a boy like him would have to pay for it. Dylan spent much of his life in and out of prison. When he was out of prison, he tried hard to build a life for himself, but all it would take would be a report in the media about child abuse or child pornography, and he would end up binging heavily on drugs and the next thing he knew, he was jobless, broke, and on the street again. And each time it grew more and more difficult to start over again. Dylan confided in me that knowing that there were images out there of himself, of his abuse, that could never be destroyed, that were there forever, was like being raped every single day. He grew up to hate men who exploited boys. In prison, he would target child sex offenders, forcing them to masturbate with sandpaper. He beat the abuser of his niece with a baseball bat, sending him to a hospital for several months. And when a young girl in his family was raped by her stepfather, he and some friends hunted him down, got him drunk on brandy, and lay him to sleep on some railway tracks. Dylan said to me that he wanted to write a book about his life, and that he would call it My Piece of Sky, after a time that he spent in prison, where he was put in isolation for 365 days. He said all he had in his cell was a little window with his piece of sky, and that he would sit there for hours with his piece of sky, contemplating his life and everything that had happened to him that brought him to this place. Dylan never had a chance to write his book. He died tragically when he was arrested again and committed suicide in the police cell. My project, which later became a book, was named My Piece of Sky and Dylan's Memory. So these are the facts about child pornography, also called child abuse material. It is a documentation of a crime scene. A child has to have actually been raped, violated, for this material to exist. According to a report by the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children in the US, they have reviewed 25 million images a year. That is to say that 480 thousand images are reviewed every week. I met Tuli when she was 27 years old. At the age of six, her father raped her. Her mother reported the rape to the police, but her father was never arrested, and the rapes continued. Tuli's parents lived in a shack, and the three of them slept in a room together. Tuli's mother and father on the bed, and Tuli beside them on a mat on the floor. When Tuli's father wanted her, he would send her mother down to the floor and order Tuli up onto the bed. He would rape Tuli in front of her mother, and she would hear her mother crying. Her mother tried to run away with her several times, but her father always found them. They reported the rapes to the police three more times, and three more times the police failed to do anything, and the rapes continued. By the age of 14, Tuli found out that both her and her mother were both HIV positive. She began drinking and sleeping around to numb the pain. She felt that every man owed her something, 
and she would punish them by sleeping with them so she could pass on the virus. At the age of 15, Tuli fell pregnant and she had a son. She said that she of, often dreamt about killing her father and would be overcome by a sense of peace and calm at the thought of him being dead. But it was not until her father threatened to abuse her son that she decided to get him killed and she hired two men to do the job. On the day of the killing, Tuli describes this desperate need to see his body to be absolutely certain he was dead. She said she went to the mortuary and she spoke to his corpse. And there she said, I am not a murderer, but you pushed me too far. And in the end, I did not have a choice. I heard about Tuli in a newspaper article about the sentencing. The presiding judge, Niels Klaassen, said that although Tuli was guilty of killing her father, Tuli already carried the punishment in her body. She was already being punished, and there was nothing more the court could do to extend her punishment. She was freed. During my decade-long uh, exploration into the world of child sexual abuse, I often ask myself, why am I doing this? And what resonates most with me are the words of the author Arundhati Roy, that we never get used to the unspeakable violence and vulgar disparity of the life around us, but that instead we watch we try and understand, and above all, that we never, never look away. Thank you for listening.